Once upon a time, there was a curious little doll customizer named Dolly Pop. Normally, she happily spent her days customizing Blythe dolls. But recently, she was eager to try something new, something exquisite, something she could print on her 3D printer. Because base dolls can be expensive. <clears throat> uh, pardon. In the past year, Dolly Pop had befriended the charming and magical dolly maker, Dollightful. From there, she discovered that Delightful and her husband had recently designed a ball-jointed rabbit doll to 3D print. Perfect! exclaimed Dolly Pop. So she quickly sent off a letter to Delightful to beg for permission to use their doll design in Dolly Pop's next video. But of course, replied Delightful. However, my doll design is very tiny. You might want to use Moonlight Jewel's file instead. She was overjoyed. So she sent off another missive, but this time to Moonlight Jewel. How lovely. Moonlight Jewel returned. But make sure you credit Blue Pixie Art. She edited and added the additional joints to Delightful's original design. Dolly Pop anxiously agreed and set off to print this new adventure. Her heart was full of hope and her printer was full of resin. I'm still kind of new with this whole 3D printing thing. I mean, I think it was about a year ago that we got our first 3D printer, and we only bought it so that we could make the ears for Allison, which was especially crazy because we had never 3D modeled before. But if you've been following me long enough, you know that I'm always trying something new and crazy. If you had told me 20 years ago that I could print a ball-jointed doll on my printer, I probably would have thought you were crazy. But here we are, I printed my first ball-jointed doll. How cool is that? All right, all right, I'll get to talking about the doll now. I started by sanding down the doll. Then in the hands and feet, we drilled tiny holes to insert a wire. After the wires were inserted, we filled the holes with UV resin. Then we cured the resin and then sanded off the excess. Using proper safety equipment and Mr. Super Clear Matte, I sprayed the rabbit's head, as well as the rest of his body. Now the real question, what color do I paint him? I've watched several videos of the making of these dolls, and each one of them gets painted these bright, vibrant colors. But I wanted to go a little more natural, so I chose gray and white. I mixed together black, white, and blue airbrush color to make this kind of cool gray, and then finished them up with a spray of Mr. Super Clear Matte. I first pulled out my new watercolor pencils, and these chalk pastels that I've had for quite a while. The reason being is that I don't have pan pastels in the right shade of pink that I wanted. These are a nice, highly pigmented brand too, but not quite as nice as pan pastels. So I started by painting his blush, and then his cute little nose. I made sure to make a gradient from his fur color to the tip of his nose color. Then the inside of his ears. Then I even added pink to the back of his ears. If you look at real rabbits, you can see a little bit of pink just popping from behind their ears. Then I added some shading to his paws and added some definition to the tuft of hair on his chest and his tail. I absolutely love these little parts of him. They're gonna feature prominently in the future. Next, I added some shading between his toes and some pink little toe beans. I mean, what's the point of making an anthropomorphic doll if you're not gonna add toe beans? Now it was time for the second layer of color. I also started putting in my white water line here. I know rabbits usually have a darker eye ring, but I kinda wanted to do something different. I did add a dark upper lash line though, so there you go. I added a little red-orange for the lacriminal caruncle. I hope I said that right. 
I don't know, it's the pink part of your eye. <laughs> then I added some definition to the eye and to the hair on the front of his ears. Okay, I totally messed up here and didn't film me painting his eyelashes. I thought I did, but I'm not gonna blame the camera here. I'm gonna blame it on user error. <laughs> Next, I added a gloss to his waterline and his nose. Then I added a satin varnish to the inside of his ears. I know most people don't gloss the inside of ears, but if you look at the inside of animal ears, they're kind of a little shiny. Which is why I used the satin, because it wasn't quite as shiny as gloss. Plus, my doll, my rules, right? So I've been seeing all these other doll customizers making their own eyes. But I didn't have one of those resin molds everyone else seems to have. So what's a girl got to do in that situation? Why design and 3D print your own set, of course. After I had prepped the eyes by sanding them, I pulled out my beautiful box of Arteza metallic paints. These pigments are just filled with synthetic mica powder that just sparkles. Not to mention that these shades are gorgeous. These are what I use when I paint Blythe eye chips. So I figured they would work for ball jointed eyes too. You've noticed that I've chosen three different colors. One of them is the base eye color, which I painted first. It's the lightest of all three shades. Then I use the darkest color to line the inner and outer parts of the iris. I feel like it adds depth to the eye. Then I use the same color to kind of create spokes that go from the outer to the inner edge. Then use the medium color to kind of blend it all together a bit. Once that has had the time to dry, I sand over the top just to remove the paint that I kind of got over the edge. Then I use some black UV resin to fill in the pupil and cure it under my UV lamp. Next, I fill and dome the rest of the eye with a clear UV resin. Then I hit it with a little bit of fire to get rid of the bubbles. Then cure it all underneath my UV lamp for several minutes. I hope these shots give you some sort of idea of the extra work and care I took into airbrushing his body. I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that there were smooth and gentle gradations between white, gray, and then dark gray. You'll notice that closer to his center, he's white, but as it gets down to his paws, he's much darker. Okay, on to stringing him. I've been collecting ball jointed dolls for a long time. And the reason why I didn't do any customizing on those dolls in the olden days is because I was terrified of stringing dolls. So this was my first shot at it and everything was going great. I was able to get it through the foot. I was able to get it through the lower leg. It was once I started going through the upper leg that I started to have problems. So I bent a piece of wire to make a kind of makeshift hook. I tried to tie a knot in the elastic. That didn't work. Finally, I discovered that if you pulled one elastic through and then pulled the second one through, that worked. Then it was pretty much smooth sailing after that. I strung the legs all the way up through the body, but the arms I put on its own string of elastic and had it tie in the center. This is how it seems most ball jointed dolls are made, so that's what I did. Next, I had my wife glue in the neodymium magnets into the back plate and the back of the head. This is what makes the two parts stick together. I had her do it because I hate using super glue. Next, let's put these beautiful brown eyes into his head. Because my doll is supposed to be anthropomorphic, I didn't want his eyes just pointing straight out. I also glued this really strong magnet to the top of his head because I thought I was going to be able to add something that way, but I ended up not using it, so whoever owns him in the future gets a little surprise. Then I attached his head by pulling the elastic through his neck hole and then securing it with an S-hook. Folks, what did I get myself into? I am not a top-notch seamstress. And this was just supposed to be a fun, quick project to do. But as I saw his cute little face start to come alive, I knew I had to make him more difficult. So I kind of decided that he was some sort of Dickensian character or maybe from like a Beatrix Potter book. And all of those characters have waistcoats, right? then so shall my character. <laughs> now listen, 
I've never made a waistcoat. And I'm sure there are no patterns for this little guy. So I kind of had to just fumble along. So like always, I started by wrapping him in cellophane. And I couldn't find my painter's tape, so I used washi tape instead. Then I marked my pattern pieces onto the washi tape. Then put it on scratch paper so I could draw some additional pattern parts. I found this adorable miniature hound's tooth pattern that I think is going to be perfect. And this really pretty white lining fabric. Then I began tracing my pattern pieces onto my fabric with sewing chalk and cut them out making sure I was using a quarter inch seam allowance. For the back side of the pattern, I made sure to cut that out of the lining fabric. And as always, when you're making doll clothes, make sure that you put fray check on your edges. Then it was time to design the lapel for the waistcoat. I decided that I liked this kind of rounded collar look, so that's what I was going for. Now, I don't know how to design a lapel. So I first started by kind of drawing the shape that I wanted. Then I traced my pattern pieces so it would fit along the neck. Then I cut out that monstrosity and transferred it to my fabric. I cut out two of these pieces. Then I cut out a rectangular piece of fabric that I'm somehow going to make into pockets. Then I pulled out these little buckles that I got from AliExpress. my sewing machine, I threaded it with a matching thread. I started by sewing a front piece to a back piece, first at the shoulder and then along the side, and did the same with the lining pieces. Then sandwiched my two new pieces together and sewed along the hem. Then I put that whole piece aside and start on the collar. I began by sewing along the outer edge, then pressed and notched my seams. After turning it right side out, I top stitched along the outer edge. This helped it lay more flat. Then I sandwiched the collar between my outer and inner pieces and sewed along the neckline and down the front side. Then turned the whole thing right side out through the armhole and top stitched along the bottom perimeter. Next, I carefully folded in the rough edges of the arms and closed it up with an invisible stitch. Remember this tiny little boy? Well, I decided I was going to make a rear cinch for the back of the waistcoat. On one side of the buckle, I looped through some ribbon and double backed it on itself. Then finished the edges with fray check. Next, I sewed a piece of ribbon to the other side, as well as stitched on the buckle side. Then looped the ribbon through the buckle. This looked kind of unfinished to me, so I stitched on some buttons. Ah, uh, that's much better. Next is one of the moments where I went temporarily insane. I used my buttonhole foot for the first time to sew a tiny little buttonhole on the waistcoat. Who even does that? It's me. I do that. Okay, now these tiny pockets. I start by folding over and stitching up the long sides, then the short sides, and attaching it with an invisible stitch. It was about this time that I decided he was no longer Dickensian. He was now from the Regency period. I was re-watching Bridgerton, okay? So obviously I needed to make him a high-collared shirt. And the little tuft of hair on his chest already looked like an ascot, so... I think you know I needed to do it. I decided to use the same white fabric as I did for his vest on his shirt. But it was a little thin, so I used two layers instead. I sewed down the front of the shirt. Then I have two front pieces of my shirt. Now I sew my shoulder pieces together. All sleeves from that time period had cuffs at the end. So I cut out these little rectangle pieces and sewed up three sides. Then turned it right side out and top stitched on those sides. Then sewed this piece to the bottom of my sleeve then flipped it right side out and top stitched along the seam. This creates a tidy little cuff. Next, I sew the top of the sleeve to the base shirt. Then fold over the shirt and sew up the arm and the sides. Mm -hmm. 
Next, I pinned the shirt opening to figure out where the back should meet, and then sewed up the back seam. Then I top stitched down both sides of the back seam. Because I'm leaving the front of his shirt open for the little hair tuft, I made a very simple collar. I sewed the outer three edges. Then I turned it right side out and top stitched just like I did with the cuff, then attached it to the neck. Next, I hemmed the bottom of the shirt, then top stitched along the entire shirt's perimeter. I was a little more sane with this part of the project, so I decided to use snaps instead of doing buttonholes. However, I made sure I was careful enough not to sew through the outer layer of my shirt. Then I sewed on little tiny seed beads so it looked like he had pearl buttons. I did this all down the front and on his cuffs. I'll bet you've been thinking, wow, that looks really terrible with that blue marker. And you're not wrong. But this stuff magically disappears with water. Ah, the necktie, the easiest sewn thing in this project. I found out the dimensions of an actual necktie. It's about two meters by 22 millimeters. I tried to scale those measurements to his size, but I failed miserably. <sighs> it's okay, it works out in the end. Essentially, I stitch up a tube and then top stitch around the perimeter so it lays down flat. Voila, necktie. If you thought I was insane with the waistcoat, you ain't seen nothing yet. All I knew is I wanted a collar similar to this one, and I found this great photo that showed how it was constructed. I mean, those back darts and those side seams are wild. Can I make this happen? I guess we'll see. I made sure to pattern him while he was fully clothed. After all, the jacket has to go on top of all of that. I just love the idea of a tailcoat going over a tail, don't you? So I decided that for the coat, I was going to make the lapel part of the main fabric. And because this pattern didn't have a shoulder seam, I tried something a little different with the collar. Hey, maybe I'm learning some lessons, right? Now the jacket cuffs, I wanted to be much larger and kind of flare out a little bit. And here's my fabric. Isn't she pretty? I decided I wasn't going to use a different lining fabric for this coat. It was going to complicate things way more than it needed to be, and it was already really complicated. So I just used the same fabric on both sides. I think this will help the jacket to look more sturdy, too. I started by sewing the back seam together. This seemed like a reasonable place to start. Then I pressed open the seam, then trimmed and notched my back seam allowance, and turned it right side out just to realize, oh, God! Ah! yeah, that was probably the worst place to start. So I ripped that seam and decided to sew down the front instead, then stitched the inner part of the tail. And while my fray check dried, I decided to start on the cuffs. I trimmed the corners so that when it turned right side out, it would have a sharper point. Next, I sewed the outer parts of the collar. I stitched the outer part of the tail all the way down, but I'll rip out some of those stitches once I fit the side to it. Now I stitched up the back seam. Remember that this coat pattern doesn't have a shoulder seam, so it's kind of like origami. Here I stitched the front of the tail to the front of the jacket. And it's kinda, sorta starting to look like something, I guess. Then I top stitched the collar and then stitched it to the coat. Then sewed the inner tail to the coat back then top stitched the collar so that it would stand up better. Then sewed my cuffs to my sleeves almost identically to how I did with the shirt. Then I attached my sleeves at the shoulder. If you followed along up to this point, then good for you, because I'm not sure I have. Next, I folded the sleeve over and then sewed up the arm. I didn't sew down the side here because this is where I had to rip out the stitches, but I eventually did it. Next, I top stitched along all of the seams so the jacket would lay nice and flat. I'm not sure how I did it, folks, but I made a tailcoat. 
coats of that time often had pointed pockets on the back, so that's what I'm going to attempt to do here. I first crease the fabric with my iron. Then on one side of the crease, I fold the tips over to make a point. Once the fabric glue is dried, I then fold it over on the crease. Then trim the excess. Then I stitched along the top of the pocket onto my coat. Now, you didn't think I was gonna let this dapper little chap go without some accessories, did you? My wife designed and 3D printed this cute little carrot cane for him. I started by mixing some acrylic airbrush paint together. I decided to use airbrush paint because it's already kind of thinned down. This will help the details pop out, but also so it doesn't look so globby. When you're making miniatures, thinner is better. I want the stick part of the cane to look like wood. So I paint it with a base coat brown that looks kind of like mahogany. Then I mix together an even darker shade of brown so that I could dry brush some lines onto it. Hopefully this gives it a wood grain texture. Then I found this Tamiya metallic brown. What's fun about it is that it looks like a precious metal, but it's also orange like a carrot. Then I painted the tip that hits the ground gold and coated the whole cane in a gloss varnish. This helps to make it look more metallic, but also protects the paint. This little dandy needs a pocket watch. So my wife designed and 3D printed one. Then I coated it in a gold paint. In order to attach a chain, my wife drilled a small hole and then fed a very thin wire through it. She then made a ring by wrapping the wire around the end of a paintbrush. Then she fed the ring through a piece of gold chain that I had, then back through the pocket watch. I decided he needed a little flower boutonniere for his jacket. We recently attended my wife's grandmother's funeral and received these little keychains. Now, Grandma absolutely loved dolls. She had a collection that is far greater than anything I could ever dream of. So I like to believe that she'd get a kick out of being some part of this doll. However, the hot pink was just not going to cut it. So I sanded the flower and then mixed up some rose red paint. Then used my airbrush to paint the rose. Would you folks be interested in some airbrush tutorials? Let me know in the comments. After the rose had dried and I had sprayed it with Mr. Super Clear, I went on to painting it with pan pastels. I really wanted it to have some depth and character to it. So I added a lot of shadows and highlights and then finished it with a couple coats of Mr. Super Clear Matte. You guys, the buttons of that time period were so pretty, but all I had on hand were these. I guess they'll have to do. I started by sanding them a bit so that the paint would stick, then coated them with that super metallic gold paint. then added an additional layer of protection by coating it with gloss. That'll do, Button. That'll do. Last but not least, this little guy needed a top hat. After it was printed, I sanded it down with finer and finer grits of sandpaper until it was smooth. And it looked pretty good. Now that that was done, it was time to move over to my spray box. I started with a base coat of white, then mixed together beige and yellow to make a color that matched his waistcoat. Then filled my airbrush and sprayed the hat. And you can't forget the Mr. Super Clear. I am really digging this color, but now I need to paint the ribbon around the base of the hat. I decided I wanted the ribbon to match the color of his tail coat, so I mixed up some more airbrush acrylics, and I think it turned out pretty good. Then I carefully began to paint it on. Because these paints are so thin, it took about three layers, and you can't forget the top of the ribbon. You probably noticed that this hat has two giant holes in the back of it. 
we modified an existing top hat pattern in order to make room for his giant ears. If I'm supposed to be assembling him, then why am I taking him apart? Well, I wasn't entirely impressed with how his torso and his neck sits. So I decided to hot glue suede those areas. You see, by adding a thin layer of hot glue, it gives those resin areas something to grip. And it's a pretty cheap and easy fix. You essentially just add some hot glue and then spread it out. So now I needed to close up the front of the coat. I had thought about doing buttonholes again, but I couldn't fit as many on there as I wanted to. So I opted for snaps again. Just as with the shirt, I made sure to only sew through the bottom layer of the fabric. This way you didn't see stitches on the other side. And that's a handsome little tailcoat. But it needs more. I had originally sewed on these little seed beads, but I didn't like the look of them. So I went ahead and removed them. But don't forget, I have my newly painted gold buttons. So I attach them to the coat pockets and cuffs. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So I attach some more to the front. And it looks so cute! but I'll add more buttons to the front later. I had my wife glue the rose to the lapel because, well, super glue. I first put on his shirt, then folded his necktie in half and wrapped around the outside of his collar. Then just like in the Regency period, you tuck the ends into the waistcoat. Then I tucked his pocket watch into his pocket and draped the chain into his other pocket. then put his tailcoat on. I got his cane ready and placed his top hat. Oh, I almost forgot. We redid the signature on the back of the doll's head, but made it look more like her actual logo. I usually sign the back of the doll's head, but because this guy has no hair, I did it on the inside. I wrote his name, the year he was made, and his number in my lineup of customizations. Then I signed my name. Now, I usually do some kind of drawing, but there wasn't a lot of space here. So I simply drew a quick carrot. All right, folks. I have the pleasure of introducing you to Elias the Rabbit. to think that this doll didn't exist a month ago. He was simply a pile of goo sitting in a bottle, and now he's this dapper little gent. <laughs> so, how do you think I did on my first ball-jointed doll? Leave me a comment and let me know. 
If you're new here and you liked this project, please consider subscribing. You'll get notified when I upload new videos. Plus, every subscription, like, share, and comment helps my channel grow. Not to mention that I also love interacting with you all. So, please stick around and hang for a while. I'd like to thank Delightful, Midnight Jewel, and Blue Pixie Art for their involvement in making the base doll, and for trusting me to make this video with their creation. Also, thank you for watching, and I hope you had a sweet time.